everyone. Welcome. Welcome back to the Impact Blockchain Conference. Uh, my name is Pierre. I'm a part of the scientific committee uh, of Blockchain for Good. And uh, this event is co-organized by Blockchain for Good and by uh, Decentralized Desire. Before diving into uh, this ReFi conference, we have the pleasure to be joined by Carol, who is a pioneer in digital literature, participatory, participatory democracy. As we, and you're an epistemologist, an entrepreneur, a social activist, so a very vocal voice in the ecosystem. I think you wanted to tell us a little bit about your view on ReFi and the dynamic that you're trying to set up with your current project. Okay, so it's maybe not my view on ReFi, even though it will open to possibilities for ReFi. Uh, first of all, I'm so happy to be here with you. It's been a lovely day so far. I've really, really appreciated the way people listen to each other. So let's go. <laughs> uh, I think that if you're here, you are interested in natural assets and uh, ecosystem services. I'm sorry, I have this terrible French accent. I hope you will follow me. <laughs> so natural assets and ecosystem services are concepts used to describe the contribution of nature to the economy. It's not a natural science description. It is an economic perspective on nature. And more precisely, it's an economic perspective on nature within the market economy. The market economy is our current economy. Uh, it's been developing roughly globally since the 16th century, and it is based on generating a lucrative cycle of wealth. This economy is dedicated to making money and profit. So this is not a judgment. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just a general description everybody agrees on. This is how it works. Natural assets and ecosystem Services has, have not always been acknowledged as being part of the lucrative cycle. It's very recently in, in the 90s that we started to say we need to take them into account. We take them for granted, it's nature, nature is for granted, it's for free. But maybe we should, we should start to assess it, assess them and measure them. Why? Well, because as nature was beginning to be destroyed, we were worried it would have an impact on our economy. It, it represented a risk, and that's how we, we, became, we began to, to acknowledge their existence and to assess them. Well, there is yet another part of the reality of our market economy and lucrative cycle that still needs to be uncovered. And it is the equivalent of natural assets and ecosystem services but not provided by nature, provided by you, provided by humans. And this is what I call contributive activity. And I'm going to talk to you about contributive activity. So contributive activity is a necessary service that is provided freely by a human, even though it still has economic value. How do we know it is a necessary service? Because if we do not do it, well, somebody else has to do it for us. And how do we know it has economic value? Because if we did not do it freely and ask somebody else to do it or machine to do it, we would have to pay for it. So let me give you some examples. You have to eat, yeah? If you don't prepare a meal, you have to buy it. So. Preparing a meal is contributive activity, and more generally, all domestic activities and, of course, family caregiving. A second example, volunteers. If they don't give their work and time freely, then employees have to be hired to accomplish their task. Contributive activity. A third example, you just bought a computer. You need to install it, restore your data. Maybe you will even have to spend a couple of hours on the phone trying to resolve some issue. It's going to cost you time and stress. And if you don't want to spend this time and stress, you'll have to pay someone to do it for you. Contributive activity. Actually, this one has a name. It's called digital labor. And we'll come back to it a bit further in my talk. So, but sometimes, and this is where it gets tricky, we actually do get paid, and it is still contributive activity. Why? Because the person who is 
who is paid is not paid accordingly to what labor would have been paid. They do not have the minimum wages of their countries or they do not have the social rights provided by labor in their countries. In France, you know, we're very lucky, our social rights, the social rights of labor include health insurance, retirement, holidays, and of course, work breaks. It's not the case everywhere. So, is every underpaid job contributive activity? No. Contributive activity is always a choice. It has some component of free will. We do it because we think it has to be done. We don't do it for the money. We do it despite the ridiculously low amount of money we could get. We do it despite its potential of ever having a solvent business model. We do it because what is necessary does not necessarily have a solvent business model. Let me give you some examples. Agriculture. In France, 25% of farmers do not make minimum wages. And they keep doing it, even though they do not have a solvent business model for their farms. And I'm sure you agree with me, we do need food and farmers. Art. Artists are rarely paid accordingly to the time they work. And they keep doing it. And it's not just because they're narcissists who wants to enjoy and have some good time. A society thrives on its art, and not just on blockbusters. We all know the story of Van Gogh. He never made a cent in his life. He was a contributor. In science also, we have contributors. Unpaid PhD students, unemployed researchers. In France, 70% of academic publishing is produced by unpaid young scientists. And it's said that the cost of an academic paper is around 20,000 euros of work. So, how can we distinguish between contributive activity and an underpaid or undeclared work? It comes down to one question. If you were not paid at all, would you still do it? If yes, it's contributive activity. If no, it's not. Well, then it's usually the moment when we are having a talk at a dinner party when somebody asks me, and what about learning? exercising, having sex, is it also contributive activity? Well, no. And you know why? Because you cannot delegate learning, training, or having sex. Nobody can do it for you. So it's not contributive activity. Contributive activity is always a service. So basically, to know if, if something is contributive activity, you need to ask the following questions. Is it necessary? If I don't do it for free, must somebody else or machine do it? Would I have to pay for it? Can I delegate it? And if I didn't get paid at all, would I still do it? On the basis of this criteria, I have mapped and measured contributive activity in France. French people provide 67.5 billion hours of contributive activity per year. So this number cannot mean anything to anyone. Let's compare it to work. French people work 41 billion hours per year, which means that our country would not run without contributive activity. We actually give 1.6 times in contributive activity what we give in work. And that uh, means if we take it for each of us, we give three and a half days of, of contributive activity per, per week, which is a lot. You give three and, five point, three point, three and a half days of contributive activity per, per week. And I told you about digital labor in France. Our digital labor, which includes also the content we create or the little stars we leave here and there, is the equivalent of 1.2 million jobs. The digital industry is only seven 100,000 jobs. So it, that we would not have a digital industry without our contributive activity. And in terms of money, if we had to pay for these uh, 67.5 billion hours, it would cost 1,557 billion euros. Doesn't mean anything either. So let's compare it to, to the current indicator of wealth, which is GDP, gross domestic product. It's about 70% of our GDP. Imagine, if we had to 
spend 70% of our GDP to provide what we provide freely through contributive activity, would there be any profit anywhere? No, no profit nowhere, no solvent business model. So what does it mean? It means that contributive activity is part of market economy. It's the invisible part of market economy. It is not some future utopian economic model like a contributive society or a share society. It's already here. We don't need incentive measures to make more of it. Even though we will need more of it. Why? Because of transition. It is not true that the transition to come will only rely on a magical green growth. It will also rely on contributors. Because now I want to talk about these contributors who dedicate their life to projects. Green projects, art projects, science projects, family caregivers. For them, when they work full time to do this, they're in deep trouble. They don't get wages, they don't get retirement, they don't even get breaks. So what are we going to do for them? And what are we going to do for them that we are going to need more and more? Because we are going to do more and more contributors. And um, this is why in 2021, with a group of people who are interested in contributive activity, that now has become a think tank, we have proclaimed the first Bill of Rights of the Contributor. And this is why, and this is why I'm here, we need to invent solutions to support contributors and contributive activity. Because maybe for you it's not much to give three and a half days per week to contrib contributive activity and you can do it easily, but it's not the case for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm going to squish by and let our panelists join us for the rest of the conversation. Thank you. So I am now joined by Luis Boreani, uh, who you, you are a refi specialist at Curve Labs. Is that correct? Yes. Feel free to add anything if I'm forgetting uh, essential pieces of your biography. So, Shitl, do you have a, a mic? No. You do not have a mic. I can share. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of uh, after such a heartfelt introduction and contribution and. Uh, uh, working collaboratively, I think uh, sharing a mic is the least we can do. Yes. So you are the head of ecosystem at the Cello Foundation, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Wonderful. And finally, Hannah Fingenbaum, you are uh, hailing from Leipzig University, and you also collaborate with, if I'm correct, the University of Darmstadt and the University of Hildesheim. Uh, and uh, you dedicate part of your uh, research, uh, part of your research is dedicated to measurement, reporting and verification, MRV, we are going to say MRV perhaps quite a lot in this panel, so MRV stands for measurement, reporting and verification of nature-based solutions and biodiversity projects, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, ad I advise, like, uh, or I've been advising, but also working on different, collaborating with different refi projects. So, terrific, <laughs> wonderful. So I'm very, very glad to have the three of you uh, on, on this panel on refi, um, and, and perhaps to set the stage because uh, not everyone. I, I mean, a lot, a lot of people have been here since 9 a.m. and are now, you know. Uh, nearly as expert as we are on uh, Web3 and sustainable development, uh, but perhaps some of, uh, some of you have just joined us. So just to really set the context straight, what's the difference between green finance and regenerative finance? Who wants to go first on this one? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question, actually. That's a question that we receive often, also in terms of um, what's refi, right? Like that's, yeah. a, that's a big debate, and I think it's a debate that hasn't been settled so far. Everybody has their own definition. I can give mine. Um, for me, refi is making use of web-free tools to m put in place uh, concepts that have been defined a long time ago by economists, environmental economists, mainly, but it also has 
uh, so something to do with social impact, in a sense. So it's making use of blockchain, web free, uh, for environmental and social impact. Would you agree? Yes, I, I would agree. I, I tend to think of it as social justice, um, climate, and impact. Um, I work at the Cello Foundation, and Cello's mission is to create a regenerative financial system that creates conditions of prosperity for all people and planet. Um, this is a mission that is really important to me. Um, my family is from a very small town in Mexico that didn't have access to running water or electricity. Um, and they had to flee their home in search of a better life because they couldn't farm it. They were farmers and they didn't have access to water anymore. They became migrant farmers in America. And I've seen firsthand how access to financial systems today can, um, well, the existing financial models, to your point, they actually leave behind those that need it most. But I've also seen how technology has the power to really kind of drive innovation and change communities um, like my own. So I, I think that it is this blend of innovation, how we're using Web3 tools to really address some of the world's toughest problems like climate and, um, and financial inclusion. Yep. All right. And um, Anna, like, do, you, do you have anything to add? Because like, it's already a complex, <laughs> quite a complex concept. So the initial question was about the difference of green finance and regenerative Yeah, finance, but right? it's really a curveball just yeah. to get you to define refi. Yeah, um, I mean, I think in terms of, so this may be more my personal perspective, but, um, but also, let's say, also a bit like science-backed in some way. Because um, I think I would rather talk about sustainable finance. So there's like a huge, like green bonds, for instance, um, but also public um, schemes, uh, su public subsidies, for instance, in terms of uh, agri environmental schemes would be like a, I would say, also a financing instrument, right, for um, uh, like, more ecological, or like an incentive for ecological actions to take our climate actions. And I think in like in all, like in that um, field, I would say um, maybe the advantage of uh, regenerative finance models or projects um, that I've seen is that they can actually fill the gap that um, Sochi already talk, like, talked about of uh, like First, work bottom up, like to, uh, turn turn the direction, um, like from top down. Ra rather, work bottom up um, and actually respond to the needs of the communities, and fill financing gaps for small projects that wouldn't like that just like fill out of these schemes otherwise. And yeah, so I think like smallholder farmers, for instance, that wouldn't ever, or like also. Um, yeah, many Global South project. I think it's really still like so. If you could look at it from an institutional investor's perspective, I think it's like often too like so hard to get um, investment because it's such a high in high risk areas, especially. So I think that that is at least from my perspective, this is some um, yeah something where refi projects can come in, work lo like with the communities locally, and also like build the bridge. Right? It's not that um, they're there to tell people what to do, you know, but um, maybe help them facilitate uh, getting funding for their restoration actions or their um, environmental protection actions. So, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, you, you've touched on so many topics <laughs> yeah. that we'll go back to after. But I mean, it's a big uh, question. So yeah, right. Wrong answer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're here to ask the big <laughs> questions, right? We're in a big venue, uh, so, so let's hag ask big questions. Uh, you, you've mentioned filling the gap. So according to the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, uh, we are facing a four trillion US dollars annual funding gap to fulfill to to reach the uh, sustainable development goals. So can Refi really unlock more of that value and help fill that gap, in your opinion? Yeah, so that's true. <laughs> First, like, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. Like, we 
have uh, to invest more in nature. Unfortunately, today the only investment vehicles that corporations or individuals can have are carbon credits, mainly. And God knows how the carbon market is sick, like we hear it almost every day. Carbon credits from Vera, from Gold Standard, where crap we recently uh, Red Plus Plus also was, uh, was put on the spotlight. So. Um, I think that what refi can do in this point is creating a greater variety of assets and also assets that are more representative of what's going on on the ground. Um, it's a new form of what's called eco-capitalism. So eco-capitalism, it's when we think that in nature there is natural capital and that all wealth depends on this natural capital. Mm -hmm. And so how do we produce new assets in eco-capitalism using web free tools? I think it's possible and there is a lot of projects who are working on that. I will give an example, Open Earth uh, Foundation, they've been working on marine ecosystem credits. It's a form of stakeable credits that showcases much more than carbon. There is a certain percentage about plastic pollution, eutrophization of the sea. Uh, carbon is just one part of it, right? And um, they use uh, DRMRV tools, so decentralized RMRV tools uh, and web free in order to make um, to, to scale those credits to the next level and make eco-capitalism assets um, more interesting and investable for, to, to unlock this investment gap. That would be a, an example. I think, um, I mean, we're all here because we're passionate about this space, and I think that this is one of the largest problems that, you know, our generation and our children's generations is facing. So it's imperative that we unlock that capital. I'm, I'm really heartened when I see studies, McKinsey published one earlier last year where they talked about just like the increase in interest, right, in terms of being able to fund, um, fund more climate projects. I think that's going to be critical. I think that with the tools in Web3, I think we're able also to provide more um, transparency to the quality and also to the impact that I think will further unlock some of that. Um, and, you know, I think there's amazing projects that are looking at, you know, not only, um, I love this term, by the way, eco-capitalism, um, not only, like, how do we how do we invest and how do we build the tools around natural capital assets, but also like how do we enable this wonderful composability of Web3 to allow others to build on them. And so then you are able to use them, like the earlier talk, to incentivize like reforestation measurement that's happening directly in communities. We partnered with um, an organization called Gain Forest in the Philippines, where if you think about like um, climate offsets, who do they benefit now, today? Large corporations, what happens? Consultants are flowing around the, web, around the world to measure this, not the communities that are actually doing these efforts. And one of the things that I loved about this project, Gain Forest, is they're teaching local communities to actually do those measurements and to participate in some of those incentives and to use them to sort of you know, benefit their own communities. And that's where I think you see this beauty of, of, of Web3. Wonderful. Anna, did you want to, to add anything to, the, to this? Um, yeah, maybe just uh, one, one short point would be, um, yeah, so I think so far also, uh, so I think you also have to look at the, the buyer's side, right? And um, like, is there a product market fit, so to say, yeah? And I think in terms of that, that was definitely lacking, I would say, in Europe, yeah? So I, I feel there's still a lot of uh, skepticism, at least in, in, if I talk about Germany <laughs> or the German landscape, a lot of skepticism towards blockchain. Oh, this is, you know, just like related to cryptocurrency. People don't understand it and it's not regulated. And I think with Mika on its way, like the regulation for tokens, at least, I think this is some really important step for the space from my perspective, like to level up to this kind of credibility, even though there's still a lot to do, I guess. And then the other point of um, uh, like, it's really nice, as uh, Louise mentioned, that um, 
you actually build a uh, representative, so to say, of the values, of local values, if you like have this variety of assets, but also what, like into what market do you sell, right? And uh, do you sell into the carbon market and where's the demand for that? I think this is still also like a question these projects have to face at some point, but um, yeah, I think that's yeah, and refi can help on both sides of that issue, on both the buyer and the seller side. Um, I don't, I don't know if it can help, but I think it has to face this uh, question, right? Uh, so yeah, I don't see so much discussion about that actually. Mm. So like people keep asking who's actually buying these things, right? And um, yeah, I think it it is something like every refi project has to face at some point. If, especially if it's about private capital coming in, then um, I think you have to make sure that it's super transparent what you measure, right? And um, I think it's really nice uh, effort, as you said about Gain Forest, that they're actually teaching people how to do that, you know? And, um, or maybe there could be other solutions to mainstream DMRV or like to make it more scalable to also communities such that they don't rely on project developers so much. Louise, I saw you wanted yeah. to react to this. Yeah, I wanted to react, yes, to but sure. I think that uh, Sochi was gonna probably <laughs> say the, the same thing than me. Yeah. Um, on the demand side, Refi creates also new types of demand because it creates new primitives of what you can do with those assets, right? Um, and so, for example, uh, biodiversity credits, new type of natural assets, uh, there is a big demand created by Stello right now, right? Because you guys want to develop uh, natural baked currencies. So currencies that are baked by, by those assets, currencies that are baked by nature. Um, this is something that is completely new to the space. It's not... a new idea it was developed a long time ago by, by Charles Eisenstein, uh, but now with Web3 Tool, it's actually possible. Is that what you wanted to say? Yeah, <laughs> and I, I'll expand on it. I think both on like the buyer and the seller, I think that you know we are seeing kind of increased demand. We're seeing this trend um, with, and let me just take a step back. If you think about who are the largest purchasers, purchasers of carbon offsets today, they are like, the Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, right? The the Apples, the Levi's, right? Some of the largest companies in the world are the largest purchasers of these offsets. And I think what's really interesting is, um, you know, in speaking to some of them as they're trying to figure out how they incentivize sort of more planet positive behavior, right? And this is really only possible with Web3, right? So the fact that now we can create a, uh, a token or an asset that's a representation of like a basket of different currencies, right? That basket of currency could be like a carbon offset. It could be, you know, a pristine forest. It could be natural water borrowing on the concepts of Charles Eisenstein. But it's now, now that you have that representation, how do you incentivize people to interact with that more? Um, and there's this project also, just to provide a use case to kind of bring this, bring this to life, there's a project called Plastics, where each NFT that you purchase represents a kilo of, of plastic that's collected. They recently partnered with FC Barcelona to produce this NFT collection, right, that is inspired by the home countries of many of their players, but now they're able to interact with their fans and really incentivize planet positive behavior. And football matches, like the amount of plastic is obscene, right? Um, and so you see, I think, these large corporations that are trying to now connect with their audience in a different way. Um, and I think that's, again, only possible with the composability of Web3. Yeah. Terrific. And before we open the conversation to the floor, uh, because to be honest, I feel like I, I would like to ask you questions for three hours, but uh, I think other people should have the privilege to interact uh, with you. I have two more questions, uh, and the bottom-up effect will be the last one. I'm saving that last. Uh, but just before that, I would like to, um, as you rightfully point out, the, one of the main issues that is plaguing green finance is the lack of trust. Right? There has been many scandals on what is the actual environmental and social impact of those projects. Are they real? And if they are real, are they really contributing to, uh, to, to um, protecting nature 
uh, are, are regenerating natural resources or protecting ecosystems. So how can blockchain technology really enhance trust in regenerative projects? Yeah, I think there is a point we need to, to maybe bring up to light here is that blockchain are great tr uh, transparent ledger we all agree on that. However, if the data that you put on it at the, yeah. the first step of the process is crap, then yeah. well yeah. done, you have <laughs> crap transparent data. It's the so, garbage in, garbage out yeah, uh, principle. Pretty much. And so the question here is Armavi again. What are the Armavi methodologies that we put in place to make sure that the data that we will input on the ledger is correct and is verified? Um, so right now, the way Ermavi goes for most of um, pro um, carbon sequestration or regeneration projects, it's, it's centralized by registries like, again, Vera or Gold Standard. It's very obscure. It's very um, hard to understand. It's also very costly. So ex it excludes a lot of small landholders uh, from, from this type of market. And what Web3 proposes to do also with Ermavi is to decentralize the process. So making Ermavi methodologies more participative um, and more transparent and uh, democratic. I'm thinking here of um, uh, the best example would be Regen Network, I guess, that is uh, proposing t an open registry, proposing to create methodologies with different uh, projects uh, for uh, different ecosystems and different situations. Yeah. I had a chance to see a demo of that in Seattle at the ReFi Summit. It was really cool. Um, and it was amazing to see these local projects basically put their registries together. Um, you know, I think absolutely right in terms of transparency. I think that's one of the things that I was, that I was drawn to blockchain is that now we could have an even greater impact and we have like the transparency to do that. I was talking to a founder in the ecosystem who was combining AI and blockchain together to sort of, you know, address some and highlight issues. And I think that, you know, to your point, yes, garbage in, we have, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that what's being put into the system isn't garbage. I think that to the point that was made earlier in terms of like, you know, organization sort of beliefs around Web3 and, you know, cryptocurrency, I think we all have an inherent responsibility to educate. Um, because I think that if the perception, you know, with some of the existing regulatory landscape is that this is, you know, not addressing some of these issues and all I see in the headlines are scams and we're doing a disservice to the technology. And so I think we're only going to get more quality data and more transparency if we're able to educate you know, um, policymakers, the general public in terms of what the potential of this te technology truly holds. I think I agree. I don't. <laughs> I yeah. don't have. I think I would have mentioned the same point as Louise as well. So it's a matter of. I mean, you can go back endlessly, right? Also, people faking at. I don't know, like their like how their lands look or their farming practices look like. You know, I mean, I think that's an in, a crucial point to still tackle. But yeah. Terrific. Uh, so. This leads me to my last question, and um, uh, I've heard, I think, Hannah, you were talking about the south, north-south relations that come with green finance, is that correct? I believe so, or am I hallucinating? Uh, Global south, sorry. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, it really makes sense, right? Because there is the elephant in the room when we talk about those value transfers, is that obviously the countries that are most wealthy are also the ones that contributed the most to climate change. And the countries that are facing the, the most imminent threats in terms of climate change most of the times are countries from the global south who need more money to invest in the safekeeping of their natural resources or the restoration of their ecosystems. And so those north-south value flows are very essential to protect endangered ecosystems, but they can also lead to heightened risks of new forms of dominations, right? Like, arguably, you could say that green finance can, in a way, if it's a very, very top-down approach, 
contribute to a new form of colonialism of uh, I give you money and I tell you how to protect your own ecosystems because I should know better than you do or I will tell you how to value them. So, so my question is really that, can ReFi, because it is based on decentralized technology and probably also decentralized governance, can it really empower local communities that are the stewards of those ecosystems to, to, to have true ownership of those regener regenerative projects? Big questions once again. Yeah, very big question. But uh, yeah, I, I would say so. At least I, I have a, a good um, good hope for that. Uh, so she does talk about gain for us, right? Uh, that's a, that's an amazing example of um, of how you can include uh, local communities um, into the process and also make sure looking at this. Uh, transparent ledger that is blockchain that they received the payment and they received the right amount of payments at the right moment, um, which you can't do right now. You don't know if Vera pays well the, the person, like th there is no way to do so. Um, and um, yeah, I don't. I, you know, I was thinking of um, Curacao. And so, yeah, so in October, Louise and I had the opportunity last year to visit Curacao. Um, it's an island, for those of you that aren't familiar, in the Caribbean. Um, and there's this beautiful project that is also part of the Celo ecosystem called Colectivo. Uh, just for, um, uh, I guess, brief history, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is uh, Curacao was highly dependent on uh, they had an oil refinery plant on the island. They were highly dependent on Venezuela. So when Venezuela's economy collapsed, uh, their economy collapsed. They had been used to like importing food um, and had forgotten ha basics, like how to farm food. Colectivo is um, doing work that is involving these local communities. It's teaching them how to create soil again, how to plant food. There's these amazing food forests that have been um, part of the island where you have communities that are you know, harvesting the forest, local restaurateurs that are accessing this. And I think this is a great example of a community coming together and able to benefit from it. This was initiated by the community. It wasn't initiated by the government. I think because of the work that they've done, it's gotten interest, right? And now there's a desire to do more. And I think that, again, goes back to like this need to educate. Is there the flip side of this argument, too? Like, can we see it absolutely leave behind the people that need help the most? Yes, and that's like, I think what we've seen throughout history. And I think, again, I go back to like, it's in our responsibility to really ensure that doesn't happen again. I think giving the power of these Web3 tools that are very decentralized and putting them in the hands of these communities, I think is just more imperative now than ever before. Yep. Yeah, I think it's also about connecting, like and at least um, if you look at agriculture um, or forestry, I think it's also about connection to the value chain, the supply chain, because, um, yeah, I, I mean, from a corporate perspective in, in Europe, like at least the ones that have to report on their supply chains now and um, it's really hard to get um, like data about um, what their farmers are actually doing, yeah, and um, like, trans like actually get the data for this transparency. And um, and I think refi can also like I mean blockchains have also been used for supply chains, right, and the supply chain transparency. And I think this is a nice way where also yeah, refi could connect to these kind of nature positive supply chains, I think, for instance, like the ecological, connect the ecological values created to, um, yeah, like the food supply or the forestry market, I think, yeah, that would be something I could add to, <laughs> to already this uh, beautiful examples of Collectivo. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to add as well that there is a refi ecosystem in Africa that is growing, like it's very vibrant. There is more and more projects being founded on the ground there. And that is something that I see mostly in Web3, right? Like that uh, people from emerging economies are um, leading the way and being founders of their own projects on the ground. Uh, it's yeah, relevant also, I think, to, to highlight. Absolutely. And so just before we move to the unconference format, 
uh, I would like to ask you if there are any other projects that you think uh, is already, you know, making refi happening at its own scale, of course. Uh, we've all mentioned Collectivo, and I think we're all in love with that project because it's really a great, great example, and we all wish to see new uh, similar projects pop out everywhere. Uh, but are there any other projects that you would like to mention for, for the crowd perhaps to check out? There is a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, it w it's hard for me to give one example. Um, I will focus on the project I'm working on right now. Um, Eco Frontiers, we're doing research and advocacy work to bring natural capital on chain. Um, it's not concrete in the sense that we're not on the ground. However, we're trying to take a bird view of what's going on and make honest research about it. Um, to put it in front of the eyes of green policymakers and try to recreate a form of dialogue between Web3 and the policy sector um, in order to redirect some public funding towards Web3 initiatives. Um, the, project, the projects that I think about are, one is Ethica, I saw the founders around here earlier today, um, really doing beautiful work in areas like Chiapas, Mexico, where they're giving undercollateralized loans to smallhold farmers to access um, equipment or seed and well, I think with taking it a step further and giving them access to new markets um, uh, and um, just for those of you that aren't familiar what typically happens is the coffee is harvested and like collected by a local hoarder mixed and then sold by volume in this particular instance the coffee is sold to like boutique um, uh, coffee makers and like sold in Europe and so when you see the farmers faces light up about how their beans are being accessed around the world it's really just beautiful to see but shout out to Tucan as well who also partnered with Ethic Hub to then provide um, incentives right to promote kind of reforestation and planet positive behavior amongst those farmers and so I think those are and yes you could go on I mean I see impact market in the audience I mean there's just so many projects that are um, just really contributing to this beautiful refi ecosystem that's the other thing that I sorry and I feel like I could talk about this for hours so I apologize but like when you I don't know does everybody work in web3 in the audience or how many people work in web3 yeah so when you think about how we measure success in Web3 today, as an industry, what, what do we look at? Things like total value locked. You see applications like DeFi Llama, right? Or CoinGecko or whatever it may be. And, and no offense towards that. I mean, that is an, a measurement. But I think I would love to see a refi index, right? That looks at impact and looks at proof of impact. And I think that, again, I go back to our responsibility as an industry. Um, and then how cool would it be able to see, to not only see those projects listed, but the individual impact that they're, um, that they're providing as well. Yeah, I've worked um, with the Kenya ecosystem recently a lot um, through Block IoT. And um, yeah, and I think that's like we do one wildlife project with Masai Mara Park, where we actually um, like, uh, uh, like, let's say, um, um, control the movements of uh, lions, especially young male lions, because they attack. So it's a human wildlife con conflict that is used through Helium Network, and uh, Helium Network is actually something um, where uh, that is um, stu like a steward-based network, basically, and they compensate contributors um, for um, yeah local hubs. So it's also uh, Web3 connected. Um, and Taka Earth would be some project in Kenya. They are um, also working with plastics, actually. And uh, so, I mean, there are many other um, sovereign nature initiative is also um, involved in that Masai Mara project, actually. So there are many uh, different, like, yeah, many great, great projects going on in that ecosystem, I would say. But apart from that, what has also, like, caught my attention a lot, of course, is biodiversity credits and the um, market or like developing market for that. So Simplex DNA um, is a project in from Switzerland, um, which actually uses biodiversity or like is intending to use um, biodiversity data on chain and um, uh, like tokenize that. 
and uh, Rebalance Earth is a project from London in biodiversity credits market. So I think there are many. So the biodiversity credit market is through that biodiversity credit alliance from the start much more connected to the Web3. So they integrated Web3 technology from the start. And like, I mean, not every project, but I think they were aware of that technology. And um, so I think a lot of exciting things will also come from that side. Wonderful. And just before I ask everyone to, to, to applaud uh, for the speakers, because the introduction was about contributive economics and uh, we've talked about the volunteers, just I want to include in this round of applause Manon and Nicole, who are two volunteers that are joining us today and are helping making this event possible.